Well, hello. Um, man, this is so much better. Uh, really thankful for every single one of you that are uh, in here today and the blessing of spending some time in person. For those of you that are online, uh, super thankful for you. Just joining in as a part of the family and the blessing that we've got to kind of still be able to worship and gather uh, even in this capacity. And then, yeah, those of you over there in H2, super thankful that you're uh, along with us on this journey as well. Um, like John said, we're going to spend a, a number of weeks, kind of an extended series talking about what does it mean to be a disciple and how do we make disciples? Uh, in Matthew chapter 28, it's the words of Jesus. They're actually parting words before he's going to ascend back to heaven where he says to his disciples, you now go and make disciples of all nations and so that we are a disciple of Jesus Christ and that we are now called to go make disciples, this is the very mission of the church. And so this is a good evaluative sort of season for us. For you personally, maybe to consider, am I really a disciple of Jesus? When's the last time that I have made another disciple? I mean, those are really legitimate, valid questions, and we should be answering in the affirmative. We should be answering, yes, like, I know for sure I'm a disciple, and my whole life is uh, really evidenced by making disciples of other people around me. That's what the church does. That's what we're about. For so many years, the church has kind of used um, a, a classroom for discipleship. We, we gather in a classroom and we kind of info dump a whole bunch of Bible and we call that discipleship. Now, the information can be really, really good, and God's word can go to work on us, but a classroom doesn't really capture God's heart for discipleship. Or other times, maybe we just go, okay, well, you're a follower of Jesus, you're a disciple, but you don't really need to know anything now, we'll just get you some good friends and put you in a group with some good friends where you, you maybe don't even learn anything about God or his word. Well, that's missing a huge component of discipleship too. Because at the root of it, to be a disciple, discipleship isn't really a, just a classroom-centric sort of thing. And it's not just a social hangout sort of thing. Discipleship is really a whole lot more like apprenticeship. And in that regard, I mean, things like Star Wars and plumbers have got the church beat. Because at least Star Wars, if you're a young Jedi with some potential, what do they do? You're a Padawan and they put you with a master Jedi and you grow up with a master Jedi that teaches you how to use the force and swing the lightsaber or whatever. And that's all fiction. Plumbers, if there's young plumbers out there that aspire to become a plumber, then you can go find an old plumber who will teach you the trade and they work with you, and they walk with you, and they, they impress upon you all the aspects of what it is to be a good plumber. The church should be leading the way in apprenticeship, leading the way in discipleship. This is where a, a, a young believer taken under the wing of a mature believer a mature believer says, hey, come walk with me. Follow my example as I'm following the example of Christ. And in discipleship, we learn. We, we learn how to hold the wrench of prayer. We, we learn what to do when our faith pipe bursts. 
we learn how to, to affix a high flow faucet to our lives that would allow love to flow through us a whole lot more than it has been, or certainly before we knew Jesus. At the core, disciple, a disciple, quite plainly, is a learner. A disciple is a follower. But more specifically, a disciple is one who does what his master does. And so just as a quick self-evaluation, are you learning from the master Jesus? Are you, are you walking with your master Jesus? Do you do what your master, your Lord Jesus does? Are you learning to think and feel and act and do more as Jesus does the longer that you've been walking with him? Are you really a disciple of his? And then quite plainly, discipleship is just this lifelong process of one believer helping another believer prepare for heaven. When is the last time you've helped another believer prepare for heaven? When's the last time you've helped another believer grow closer in their relationship with Jesus? This is the fundamental mission of the church. This is what it is to be a Christian, is to be a disciple and to make disciples. And so I'm excited, I'm, I'm hopeful that over the next couple of months that God does a work in our own hearts and he does a work in our church that's absolutely revolutionary. And that we move from just attending a program or, or uh, going to a class or hanging out with other believers and we get our hearts sparked to allow Jesus to disciple us and then use us to disciple others. Are you ready? Online, if you're ready, you do a thumbs up in the chat or whatever. The rest of you, if you're ready, um, you don't need to say anything. Just go. Okay, good, good. I can't, I can't see expressions or anything because you're all masked and, you know, so you could fall asleep. I couldn't really tell at this point. <laughs> but it's better than staring at a camera. I can tell you that right now. For most of you. Some of you, I don't know. Um, just kidding. Mark chapter three. Mark chapter three is the, the moment here we're gonna look at where Jesus calls his disciples. Uh, he calls the 12 disciples. Now by this point, uh, this is early in the life and the ministry of Jesus now, Jesus already had called a couple disciples. And now he's also taught quite a bit, he's performed some miracles, He's got on the radar of people enough where now there's a crowd that is coming to follow Jesus. And he's interacted with the crowd. He's brought healing to the crowd. He's taught the crowd. But here's what's so key. Jesus distinguishes his disciples from the crowd. And as followers of his, as real disciples of Jesus Christ, you should be able to distinguish yourself from the crowd. Because there's a crowd then, and there's a crowd now. There are people that are kind of gathering and they kind of want to see what Jesus is up to, and that's fine. There are others that are in the crowd that are real skeptical of Jesus, and Jesus makes room for that. There are people in the crowd that just want to see what Jesus might be able to do for them. Jesus makes allowance for that. But when it comes to his disciples, he calls them out of the crowd and into something much better and much deeper. And that's what he's got for me and you is discipleship, to be a disciple of his. In Mark chapter three, We'll have weeks and weeks to talk about all the ins and outs of what a disciple is and what discipleship really looks like and how to do it and what it doesn't look like. 
But today I just wanna give you two simple elements to discipleship. Two simple elements that I see right here in the text we're gonna look at today of discipleship. Mark chapter three, look at verses 13 through 15. And I'm gonna give you the two elements beforehand. Here they are. Disciples of Jesus will be with Jesus and disciples of his will be sent out by Jesus. That's really core to every disciple. They'll be with Jesus all the time and they'll be sent out by Jesus. Look at this, verses 13 through 15. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those who he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. He makes it super clear, at least with these disciples that he's calling out, here's an irreducible minimum. You're gonna be with Jesus. That's a huge component of being a disciple of his. You gotta be with him. But then the end goal wasn't just that you would just hang out and be with Jesus, it's that you would be sent out to do the work of Jesus. And so for me and you as disciples, does it, does it do anything to your heart to know that Jesus wants to be with you? I hope that it does. I hope that it sparks something in you just to know for the first time maybe today or be reminded Jesus wants to be with you. He wants to spend time with you. Now the disciples had it in a front row seat, flesh and blood sort of deal. And that would have been so special, right? They would have been with him in the fullest sense. I mean, they could listen to him, they could converse with him, they could experience the highs and the lows with him, they could ask questions with him, all sorts of time with him. But even disciples today, an irreducible minimum is that Jesus wants to be with us. I'm with him when I pray with him. I'm with him when I read his word. I'm with him when I gather with other believers and we're considering him and we're worshiping him and we're exalting him. That's time with him. But I think about the volume of my day and, and just how many hours I've got in a given day knowing Jesus wants to be with me every single step of the way. When I'm out in nature, when I'm driving from one place to another, and the beauty is that he is with me. When I'm aware of it or not, when I'm considering him or not, he's right there with me. But we can grow like the disciples did in what it means to really walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus and interact relationally with Jesus. He wants to be with us. But then he also wants us to be sent out by him. What's he do with his disciples? He send them out to do what? To preach and to cast out demons. He sent them out to expand his ministry. He delegated authority to his disciples. Guess what? That authority has been given to those of you that are now disciples of Jesus. And God's intent was not just that you would receive something and then hold it to yourself, but that you would receive something and then now be used by him to be sent out to your neighborhood, to your friendships, to the workplace, across the globe, to be sent out to proclaim, to preach the gospel, the good news. Sometimes you use words and sometimes you just live it but you're proclaiming nonetheless. That somebody knows you, they are going to be loved by you the way that Jesus would love them. That's proclaiming the gospel. And then sometimes you get to use words too. 
And then casting out demons. Now for the disciples, that was quite literal. In their scope of ministry, there were some signs and wonders that needed to take place that were establishing, one, that Jesus was the sovereign son of God and that now his disciples also came with his authority. For us here today, we've got probably more authority and more spiritual power than we're aware of. At the same time, the link between preaching and casting out demons, honestly, there's an overlap. Here's something you should know. Whenever you go preach the gospel, whenever you live out the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done, it also makes the enemy flee. When you're living out the gospel as a disciple, when you're preaching the gospel, when someone receives the gospel, you have just been used by God to defeat the enemy. And so there's this receiving of the good news and then there's a congruent, simultaneous defeating of the enemy. When your heart gets captured by the love of Jesus, then the enemy goes down. When you love people like Jesus, then the enemy goes down asunder. We need more disciples. We need more of those who will make disciples. And Jesus is our model. Jesus is our example. You know, the noun disciple and the verb to make disciples doesn't occur anywhere in the Bible except in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts. And so for us to learn what it is to be a disciple or get better at making disciples, we're gonna look to Jesus. He he gave us a model and it starts quite simply with, okay, to be my disciple is to be with me. I want you with me. I wanna be in a relationship with you. And then to be my disciple is to be sent out by me to bring the good news. When I was in high school, my youth pastor's name was Eddie. I had gone off and on to church, uh, grown up, but got plugged into my youth group for the very first time when I was 15 years old. And that was the real spiritual turning point in my life at 15 years old. I showed up for the very first time at a Sunday school class And I was sitting there, I didn't know hardly anybody in the room, I just moved to a new city, and the door flung open, and the youth pastor, Eddie, walks in, his hands full of books, and he he came in just like a whirlwind. He was so full of personality. And he threw all the books down, and then he turned around, and he, oh, here's a new kid, it's me. And so he came right up to me, and he goes, hey, I'm Eddie, what's your name? I said, I'm Ron. He said, oh, great, we should hang out. I went, oh, okay. He goes, get your parents to write you a note saying that they'll let me take you out of school and this week I'll show up at your school and I'll bust you out of school and I'll take you to lunch. This is the best deal ever. (laughs) I left, I went back to my parents and I said, the youth pastor wants to spend time with me. He said, you just need to write a note and he'll bust me out of school. They said, fantastic. (laughs) And they wrote me a note. And two days later, Eddie busted me out of school. And we just spent time together. And what what I saw modeled in Eddie was something that Jesus would do. What Eddie stepped out and said was, I wanna spend time with you, Ron. It's what Jesus is inviting every single one of us to. I want to spend time with you. I want to be with you. I'll write you a note to the effect that tells you I want to be with you. I'll make a way for me and you to be together. And then can we spend some time together? That's what I'd really like as a disciple. And he just continued to disciple me. Over that sophomore year of high school, he continued to disciple me, and I really, truly, I think, gave my life to Jesus that 15-year-old sophomore year. 
And sometimes uh, when Eddie would hang out, it was just hang out. It wasn't um, come to youth group. It wasn't come to Sunday school. That wasn't the sole mechanism that he was using to disciple me. My favorite times were, hey, Ron, I've got to run a bunch of errands today, some for the church and some for my family. Do you want to come be with me? Yes was always my answer. And sometimes we'd get in the car for three hours and we'd run all these errands. But while we were together, while we were in the car, the conversations that we were able to have, the questions I was able to ask about God, about the Bible, about Jesus, about his life, about his family, that was priceless time between me and him. And, and Jesus used that time to change my life. Jesus used that time to impress upon me that what I was getting with Eddie is what Jesus wanted with me, time. To be a disciple of his. But Eddie didn't just give me time. He knew that the discipleship isn't just about hangout, but it's also about being sent out. And so late in my sophomore year, Eddie says, it's time for you to get to work. What? I thought we were just gonna run errands and hang out. Oh, no, no, no. There's a whole mission and a purpose for you. Oh, what's that? Well, you're gonna go out and you're gonna proclaim the good news and, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't wanna do that. And he said, no, I got a good spot for you to start, junior high ministry. I said, I really don't wanna do that. I said, I'm only two or three years older than like most of the kids in there. He said, it doesn't matter. I said, Eddie, I don't know anything about the Bible yet. He said, well, you know more than you think you do. I said, no, I don't. You were just talking last week, Eddie, about Abraham. I thought you were talking about Lincoln. <laughs> I don't know anything yet. He said, that's okay. You're gonna go into the little junior high hut on the top of the hill on the church campus and you're gonna start to teach junior high Sunday school. Here's how it's gonna work. You and I will meet on Wednesdays. We'll prepare the lesson together and then you'll go up there on Sundays and you'll teach it. And just remember, if, if any time some junior higher asks a question that you don't know the answer to, you just say, I don't know but I'll find out this week and I'll let you know next week. And what he was just modeling for me there was there's patience here, there's time for me to learn, I'm not gonna get this right right out of the gates and I didn't. The first day in the Sunday school class, the junior hires turned into the Lord of the Flies. <laughs> and they actually set off a fire extinguisher in the middle of my lesson. It filled the whole room and we all ran scurrying out. And parents are looking up from big church going, what's going on up there? Oh, Ron's teaching Sunday school. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we had a whole bunch of gracious disciples, old disciples, I mean, way older than you. And then they sat in the church. Years later, I took over for Eddie as the youth pastor at that church. And the first day, the first day that I was really doing youth group, junior hires broke into the main worship center where we were gonna be gathering. They had pews. And they had just spent money covering the pews with cushions, with fabric instead of sitting on hard wood. And the junior hires broke in on my first week on the job and they began to throw grape jelly packets at each other in the sanctuary of the church many of which splattered the brand new fabric that had just been put on the pews. The following week, I got up in big church with all the 98-year-olds, and I was ready to just let them crucify me or stone me or whatever they were gonna do. But I apologized, and I said, I'm so sorry about the grape stains on the brand new, and I only got like two or three sentences in and one old disciple, one old saint named Dr. Bob Carpenter, I'll never forget him, he stood up right in the middle, in the middle of my, my apology, and he said, Ron, 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 stop it. Stop, you don't need to apologize. 
He said, those grape stains will forever remind us that we care more about kids than we do about our pews. That's a disciple. That, that's a gracious disciple. That's a patient disciple. That, that, that modeled a whole lot of the, the grace and the mercy of Jesus to me. And I learned a ton in that moment that's affected me still to this day. He wants us to be with him. What a privilege. And then he wants us to be sent out to make other disciples and to do his work. What a privilege. But both are key. If you just are with him and you never are sent out, man, good luck because you're missing so much of the Christian life. The opposite's true. If you try to go do the work of Jesus without ever being with Jesus in a relationship, you're gonna be burned out and exhausted before you know it. And so both components are key. And lastly, look at this. Look who he picks, verse 16 and on. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now Luke, in his account of this, records that Jesus spent all night before in prayer. There was a prayerful selection of these disciples. He'd already called out a couple of them, and in this particular moment, now they round out the 12. But look at who he picks. Four fishermen, one tax collector, one who's a member of a radical political party that often got violent, one who says right here at the beginning was gonna betray Jesus, and then five guys that we know almost nothing about. All of these guys were lay people. There was not one expert in the scriptures or in preaching of the 12 of them. You know, Jesus will welcome all types. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to salvation. He loves every single one of you in here. And he doesn't just want you out in the crowd. He wants you to be a disciple of his, a learner of his, a follower of his, one who's doing what he does. But when he calls to your heart, the call of discipleship is a call to your heart. And the real call to discipleship to your heart and to my heart, it's got a cost to it. See, to be a disciple of Jesus is, it's a big thing. And the heart for discipleship, Jesus himself says in Mark chapter eight, just a couple chapters later, I'll read this and we're done. Mark eight, verse 34. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? And so if I am a disciple, then I am going to deny myself and take up my cross and follow him daily. If I am a disciple of Jesus, then the very starting place is I am going to die to myself and now live for him. That's the starting place of a disciple. In a very odd way, if I am a disciple, I am going to now win by losing. 
And I'm going to, in an odd way, live by dying to myself. Now I gotta tell you, living like that, living like a real disciple, that doesn't come naturally to me. And it takes a long time. It took a while for the disciples to really get it, didn't they? It took them a while. It's taken me a while. But we've got an incredibly patient God. We've got a gracious, merciful God who quite simply says, then let's start with this. Just be with me first. And I'll teach you how to humble yourself, say no to sin, and yes to me every single day. And what's more, I've already sent out some other disciples and they're gonna come around you to be hands and feet and a voice, tangible touch of Jesus when you need it most. We've gotta evaluate ourselves as disciples of Jesus Christ and consider all the more in this next season what it really means for us to be a church that takes the great commission in Matthew 28 seriously, saying, I am a disciple, and now I am going to be obedient to go make disciples of all nations. We've got God with us every single step of the way. And so, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you've given us a model of how you discipled others the type of relationship that you want with us. We thank you that you have delegated ministry to us. We thank you that you offer a relationship with us. We pray, Father, that you would use this time in the next several weeks just to grow us up, to encourage us up, and to mobilize us, Father, to be and do all that it is that you have called us to be and do. Thank you for loving us so much every single step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen.